Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Thanks yeah, for coming. Absolutely. It's so wonderful to in be my, out here with you. In my new hood. I know. Look at it. It's gorgeous out here. Well, Steve, it has been such an honor to know you all these years. It has been a joy. And you've been a fearless civil rights champion and leader, one of the fiercest advocates, not only here in the city of Philadelphia, but across the nation uh, for, for the rights of the disenfranchised, whether you, um, it is for people who of, of different abilities, trying to find accessible sidewalks and safe streets, to fighting for immigration, justice, civil rights laws, welfare rights, welfare rights, our schools, just, you know, covering the gamut. Um, and we're just going to be so excited to honor you and city council uh, with a resolution that talks about the history of your work. Thank you. But in advance of that, I, I thought it would be fun just for us to have a conversation together about your life and about sort of your path and what you see and, and felt were like different okay. roadmaps and okay. like directions to push you on your path towards justice. And, you know, just really love it. So thank you. My pleasure. So one of the things that I thought we could start off with is just talking about the history of all the victories. I mean, are there are there any that particularly stand out to you, like victories, victories, victories that you're particularly yeah. proud of Several. and felt were transformative? Several. First, obviously, is the curb cut lawsuit. Every time I pass one, I thank you. Right. Um, one, and that was because, you know, it's just symbolic and you see it. Um, and that victory actually got reproduced all over the country. The other uh, uh, case that was really, really important that people don't realize is um, when the ADA was passed in 1970, um, there's a, there was a provision in it that said that services had to be provided in the most integrated setting appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I, I found this provision um, in the regulations and I talked to the Department of Justice, they said, no, 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 no. This is aspirational, not an entitlement. So I brought this case on behalf of a woman who actually, it was the Philadelphia nursing home. She had two teenage uh, sons that lived three or four blocks from the Philadelphia nursing home who visited her every day. And the only thing she wanted was to get out and get services in the community and live at home with them and see them and graduate mm -hmm. and see them graduate from high school. Well, at, the, at that time, this is 1995, 96, there were very, very few Medicaid services that were provided at home. Um, and one of the things that I did was we brought this case, we lost in the district court, but then won in the circuit. And, and it was really, really important. I remember coming home and ringing the doorbell and Barbara answered and said something like, you won, it was called Hell and Hell, um, also, and I just burst out crying uh -huh. because I knew it was going to be a transformative yeah. nationally, much more, I think, than, than the curb cut actually was. And because it really gave people the, the entitlement, the right mm -hmm. to say that it was a civil rights statute and not providing services in the most integrated setting was a violation of it. I said, now it's much more in the community. So it's really been terrific. That, Incredible. That, yeah, that was a very important decision. And totally transformative because totally it brought right, people right. into a bigger Correct. fold, Correct. you know, and, um, you know, all. So thank you. Incredible. Um, thank you for sharing that. The um, so, you know, I know for me personally, a journey through um, activism and uh, political life, not in the elected sense, but political in the most right. real of sense for us, for both of us. Um, has not taken like a straight linear path. It's not right. like we knew where we were going to go, you Correct. know, when we were 20 something years old. Um, and I'm curious, like, could you tell a little bit about um, different factors that kind of steered you towards where you were? Yeah, were I there mean, mentors who stood out or a particular place that just really shaped who you became? Well, and, I was and born and raised in Philly, in yeah. Kensington, um, and in a white neighborhood, and there's very, very few blacks or people of any color other than whites. Um, and I went to public schools there, all, all white, basically. And then I went to Central. Uh, and then I went, in college, I, w I actually went to the South. It's the only school we could afford um, at the time. My parents were very, very poor. 
Um, and it was the beginning of the both the civil rights movement and the and then quickly thereafter Vietnam. And those two issues really, really, really triggered me. Uh, and we were I was getting married at the time, and my wife shared my um, my political interest. I mean, we shared political interest um, a lot, and um, you know that was basically the rest of us. You know, between the civil rights and the Vietnam War, we were getting arrested. We were doing political stuff, um, basically to, to try to push the country uh, in ending the civil war and then push the country into make having more integrative racial policies. That after that, I, in the end of the 60s, I, when I was in law school, I started working with the welfare rights movement. And in Philadelphia, we mm -hmm. had both Louise Brookins and uh, Roxanne sure. Jones. Oh, Roxanne Jones. Right. And these two women were basically absolutely out there to, to increase welfare issues. And I knew nothing at all about welfare, public welfare, and they educated me an awful lot, both of them. And, and both of their their policies as well as their activism. I mean, I had a picture of Roxanne one time climbing up the outside of the wow. uh, state office building to get in one of the windows, you know, and, and she was much more the act, that kind of an activist than Louise Brookins. But both of them, you know, they both were very important. And, and, went, and then I, I actually went to law school in order to do public interest litigation. It's um, amazing. And the 60s was, the, you had to do stuff to basically stay out of the, the war and the military. So I went to school social work and then I went to law school. I went to Penn and the rest is history. I went immediately to legal services in 1971, where I was for at least 10 years. Um, and doing public interest, doing medic Medicaid, doing school stuff. Um, a lot of cases initially regarding schools. Um, one of the first cases I had that I'll never forget was kids in West Philadelphia were being, it was a black school, were being suspended for incredibly length of time. It wasn't a three day limit suspension. So I had in my office this chart of all these kids and the number of days they were suspended. It was amazing. Um, and when I, with that case, got a, um, a common pleas judge to rule that kids could only be suspended for a limited number of days. And we, you know, we, we put a number of school cases um, regarding different things, chipping away, chipping away. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, I didn't start public, I didn't start doing disability stuff until 82 or something when um, someone came in the office from ACLU. They lost the case. Um, with regards to a, a bus driver who was hearing impaired. And I told ACLU, sure, I'd be glad to take an appeal and represent you. I have nothing <laughs> nothing to do other than my time. Um, and we brought this case, and I really got into disability and the stereotypes. Yeah. Um, and we won in the circuit court, so we changed that too. That was the James Strathic case. Amazing. And I feel like, you know, your work has just really redefined well, I, how the law treats those of differing abil abilities. And I think it's that's been, correct. yeah, it's just been, you know, it is amazing to hear you say that um, it was, you know, it was partly your work. And, um, you know, one of the things I loved reading about you, especially people who love to talk about you, um, <laughs> is that uh, someone described you as a true servant of the social movements that you felt you represented. And well, I think I both always, of us right. feel very strongly about the social movements We're that both right. propelled us forward, defined us, surrounded us, that we were part of. Um, in the, in yeah. the 70s, definitely, the welfare rights movement sure. was very, very, very strong. I mean, and in the 80s, I mean, I always, every case that I brought on disability, there was always a group I represent, a national advocacy we called the ADAPT, A-D-A-P-T. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they, they set the uh, agenda. They were the ones who said, you know, curb cuts and get people out of nursing homes and whatever the other issues were. And I just basically tried to figure out legal strategies mm -hmm. to implement their wishes. But I mean, it was always, I mean, twice a year, 
adapt would go to Washington and do civil disobedience. Um, and I would always go down with them. Sometimes I got arrested with them. Sometimes I didn't. Um, <clears throat> but it was always amazing to see several hundred uh, disabled people um, really empowering themselves with so their funny. actions. I mean, most recently, I mean, ADAPT, I think, was the reason we still have the ACA, the Amer mm -hmm. uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, mm -hmm. When the Senate was holding hearings, they brought 400 people and they just basically surrounded the, the, the Senate office building or Senate office door. Um, you know, and basically said, we're not gonna let you play around with our, our health rights. Yeah. They, we kept the ACA because of ADAPT, I think. Yeah, I mean, you've been a huge believer in civil disobedience. I know one yes. of the uh, <laughs> most recent events that we saw you or we, we were together in was the ICE protest um, outside of the immigration offices uh, here with you and the rabbi and a number of different uh, people sitting in and getting arrested over uh, the treatment of immigrants. Do you remember your first protest at all? Uh, like, I remember the ones that really defined me, but I'm curious whether you remember either the first protest you ever organized or, you know, or participated in, or the one that was most defining for you in your early years. The draft boards. Okay. The draft boards one, and um, we always got a When was this? In this? Oh, the end of the 60s. Yeah. Um, no, I re never forget, and I'm sure you don't know the name, Graham Finney. He was the deputy superintendent of the schools on, with Mark Shedd uh, in the 60s. And um, I worked in his office, as did my wife. Um, and one morning we thought we could just be down in the draft board at 6 a.m. and, you know, basically demonstrate and maybe close it down or something so people wouldn't be able to get in. And the cops came and swept us all. Oh. We were in jail at least, I don't know, 20 hours or something. Um, and we came back the next day and Graham said, uh, and it was the front banner page of the, the banner headline of the newspaper, you know, the pub, uh, school board officials get arrested blocking, <laughs> <laughs> right? And needless to say, I mean, Graham Finney and Mark Shedd were, were very, very progressive. Yes. Um, so. You know, we got kidded a lot. Actually, Graham, who's still alive, um, every time he sees us in a social event, will always introduce us as, <laughs> as, as people who got arrested when he was the deputy <laughs> superintendent. No, I think that Amazing. was probably the, fir the first big one. First Amazing. big ones. But there were a lot. There have been a lot. Yes, there have been. No, but civil disobedience is very important. Um, civil disobedience basically pushes the envelope and pushes... The, the issue much more than a, a lawsuit with mm -hmm. lawyers filing mm -hmm. papers. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean the reason we have accessible buses, uh, I was thinking about this interview and I, about it, was, I don't know what year it was, it, sometime in the 90s. Um, ADAPT basically closed down Market Street by putting people in front of the buses, so buses blocked it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it really takes guts. I mean, much more guts than I have to see a person getting out of a wheelchair and mm, yeah. s sitting and laying in front of a bus. Right. No, it's so true. I mean, I think we both agree, you both as the lawyer, myself coming out of the activism world, that the two needed to go hand in hand and that Absolutely. the law Absolutely. isn't just some static thing that exists on a piece of paper. It's defined, redefined reinterpreted, acted upon, expanded, and so and it's, it's got to be... it's important for judges mm -hmm. and, you know, to, to know that there are real people involved. That's right. I mean, every big case that I brought um, and argued, I demanded, absolutely demanded, and they complied, mm -hmm. that people with disabilities would be in the courtroom mm -hmm. to be seen because of their case. Right. I was just a spokesperson. I was, you know, yeah. behind, you know, writing papers and making arguments, but they, it was their rights, it was their oppression that was really at, at mm -hmm. stake. Speaking of which, you know, you've been a lifelong Philadelphian and you've certainly been part of, you know, incredible movements, some of which, you know, are just homegrown here from the welfare rights and neighborhood battles um, that have gone on school district. But there are ones that started here and just became national, the disability well, they, rights work the that you've done, the housing, housing work. Yes, absolutely. No, um, so are there, 
how do you see the landscape of the city's activism changing? You know, you have been, you have borne witness, you have been uh, a supporter of, you know, as well, one, somebody I mean, the from issues the service are yeah. The issues have been different. Like the one movement that has truly amazed me, and I wish the disability community would, would do the same one was the LGBT. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that, you know, L and B and G and T would all unite around a common issue mm -hmm. is something we've not been able to accomplish mm -hmm. in the disability community. We still have silos. You have the intellectual community here. You have the physical community here. And rather than one united disability community, um, and one of the things we've been going to do, mm -hmm. or, yeah, that has begun. I haven't been mm -hmm. as active in it as other people. Is to basically try to convince the disability community to become a voting block. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are 45 million disabled people, of different disabilities, and the common interests are health care, you know, et cetera, et cetera, how accessible housing that. You know, if they were, to, instead of thinking about it, just one silo versus another silo mm -hmm. versus a third silo, but think about it like the way the LGBT community has really done a terrific job. Yeah. Really. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. The next, the our work ahead, for yeah. sure. And it's also a voting issue. I mean, mm -hmm. the, disab the disability community has never voted the way the LGBT community has. Mm -hmm. It's important. Yeah. Yeah, oh, powerful. Thank you. Um, so uh, we should talk a little bit about our losses. <laughs> uh, losses there are a lot of them. Oh, yes. And I think that's why, you know, one of the things I often say is that, you know, we understand what it means, how important it is to win because we've lost. Right. Um, and the consequences are enormous and all of this. Were there ones, are there moments in time that oh, yes. you can look back on where <laughs> you thought that, it was you just weren't going to make it and then what helped you persevere through no, no, through loss much and more, uncertainty i mean one of the things i am a pollyanna um and i really every case that i bring i think should be won and could be won mm -hmm. and when you take a loss like in one of the housing cases big housing cases that i lost was um there's a, re, a federal requirement that five percent of new houses uh, federally funded be accessible. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, Philadelphia was a great example in public housing. There were many, many places where they made it, built a, a lift to get in, but didn't, didn't didn't hold it for a person who needed it. Mm -hmm. So he brought that lawsuit and it went on for a year, two years, whatever, a long time, and we lost. Um, and it really depre depressed me for several months. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm like everyone else, you know, you want to win. And when you lose, you lose. I mean, the, like the last case we were driving a few weeks ago, and there's a building at 12th and Vine, I don't remember the name of it, that, you know, built and didn't have 5% of the units accessible. Mm -hmm. And I brought that case, mm -hmm. um, and there was a regulation that I was trying to invalidate um, through the lawsuit, and we lost. And still, you know, it's a big place with, with, without 5% mm -hmm. of the, without any accessible units. So yeah. They, they and how do you persevere? Yeah, you just get up the next morning. I mean, after the depression of several months, of which there is, is always <laughs> on a big one, um, you just go bring the next lawsuit. I mean, you know, I'm very privileged. Uh, I know that I'm white. I was able-bodied until a few years ago. Now I am disabled. But, you know, and I have enough money that we can always, we never had to worry about food. It, or kids going to school. Um, so, I mean, I just feel very, very privileged mm -hmm. uh, and, and very lucky to be married to a woman who agrees with me and is a partner. And we just keep on trucking. Yeah. Oh. And give back. And give back. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah. Well, um, well, we should end on on this note, which is both of us, are fortunate to have all for me almost lifelong partners um i've been I'm, married 55 years i'm 30. <laughs> i've got a ways to go for you um but yes better. you have a wonderful partner of over half a century right. and um in barbara who's been incredible and the two of you together side by side um it feels like 
you know, nothing feels impossible. And so, you know, just tell us, tell me a little bit about your journey with Barbara and what it means well, to like love. We met at a civil rights activism. conference. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. In 63 uh -huh. at Bryn Mawr. Um, Do you remember the moment oh, that yeah. you met her? Oh yeah, she okay. does. I don't. Um, okay. She, it was uh, Jesse Gray from New York City was doing rent strikes at the time. And I went to one of his seminar, the seminar that he was, and there's a seat open and she comes in and she says, his, retrospectively, that he, she saw these blue eyes and she said, he's the guy. And she sat down next to me and the rest, it wasn't history, but it was, it, we, you know, we went at, we did some dating, et cetera. But one of the, the first re things that I never will forget was a demonstration. I was working in Chester at the time and, um, we had been dating maybe a month, six weeks or whatever, maybe two months. Um, and I called her up, we had a date. I said, you know, this is my last time. I'm in jail. Um, I can't get out. You're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And, and she was not, I made it all up, obviously. But she was just totally panicked, not knowing what to do in terms of this guy who, you know, who, me. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, we... We've struggled a lot. I mean, marriage and you know, we have two children, terrific children, um, but it's been a, you know, we work, we work. Marriage and relationships are hard, yes. as is mo mo uh, doing political movement stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, in any number of times we've had to bow out because we I've disagreed with them, poli with political allies and what they were doing, et cetera. And, you know, keep going. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a struggle. Yeah, but love makes it worthwhile. Oh, uh, what, what? Love makes it all love worthwhile. Love makes it worthwhile, yeah. but also the political ends make it work. Yeah. Worthwhile. Right. I mean, both are very important. It's wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Oh, Thank you for thanks. this wonderful conversation. Don't and be silly. yeah, Keep we love going. it. Love it. We appreciate you so much. Well, I very much appreciate your recognizing me. Yeah. I'm glad that I didn't know ahead of time. I would have said no. And she would have said. <laughs> Jen knew that. That's why she called me. Yeah. yeah. My reputation clearly preceded me. Yes, always. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you, Ellen.